um, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Daniel Lillyhook. Uh, so I am a partner here at JP Bullhound based in Stockholm. And uh, today, today's webinar is on the topic of Norwegian tech. And it's sort of the kind of the, the first of a series of reports and webinars we're doing uh, along the Nordic markets, you can say. And we, we felt that we, we wanted to actually start with Norway. Uh, it could have been natural to start with Sweden, being a Swede myself, but, but we feel that Sweden gets so much uh, attention all the time uh, when it comes to tech. And, and also, I think many of us here have, have noticed that there's a lot going on in Norway um, recently, the last couple of years. So we, we felt that we, would, we wanted to sort of shine the spotlight on Norway. Um, and just sort of the agenda for this webinar, we, we did release a report. Uh, which you can download from, from our homepage for free. Uh, if you haven't done that already, please do so. And, and the report has a lot of graphs and statistics, uh, et cetera. And we're, we're not gonna go through that um, in, in detail today because it's, it's not really sort of webinar friendly. Um, but of course, we're gonna go through some of the highlights. Uh, but if any of you are sort of interested in discussing that in, in more detail with us, you know, just reach out and, and we can can set something set something up. Should also mention that this this webinar will be will be recorded. Um, so I'll, I'll watch my, my tongue here speaking about Norway. Um, there is also the possibility to to post questions, um, and we, we will try to make some some time. We ha we have sort of forty five minutes uh, up up to an hour in total. So we'll, we'll see. It's always with these webinars we we want to make it as as interactive as possible. We're also joined by some, some, some speakers, some panelists here, which we are really happy about. And I'm gonna introduce them in a second, but I'll first uh, start the sort of presentation. Uh, if I can get the, I'm gonna get the technology to work here. Now you can see it, <laughs> apologies for that. And uh, again, I mean, this is a webinar, so, um, uh, if, if it was on stage, I, I would have asked if anyone sort of knows what this is. Um, but um, um, th so th this is the this is actually the it's an offshore gas platform called the Troll A. Uh, now I remember myself when, when it was commissioned back in 1996, and, and perhaps you're wondering why, why we're showing this, but perhaps it's it's obvious. I guess it's kind of a a symbol symbol of the of the heritage and, and legacy of Norway. But it is actually recognized as one of the uh, one of the greatest engineering uh, feats in, in the history of, of mankind. Actually, when you when you read up about it, so so it says something about the, the sort of the, the sort of the tech. When we speak about tech, the competence and engineering capabilities of Norway, um, and, and it was commissioned in, in 1996. It, it took five years to build. I think in today's value terms, it cost something like a billion dollars. Um, and it's 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 known for, for sort of two things. One is it's almost 500 meters in total length, um, and it, it has a, it weighs does a displacement of 1.2 million tons. And it, what it's also very known for is that it was moved 200 kilometers over seven days in the North Sea, uh, which was actually televised. I think it was the the first evidence of, of what we today would call sort of slow TV. Uh, and it was part. It was also in the Guinness Book of uh, of world, world Records for the biggest gas platform at the time. I'm not sure if there's a bigger one today, um, but uh, clearly, clearly very impressive. So we, we just wanted to show that it, it's a webinar, so have a little bit of, of visuals. But again, it's um, it, it's a great, great accomplishment and great engineering skill. I think we can move to the next slide here. And then to start introducing the, the speakers um, before we go over to the panel discussion, um, start with the entrepreneur, of course, uh, Jörn Lysegen, who I'm sure many of you know, uh, the founder of, of Meltwater back in 2001, or it was known back then, it was called Magenta News, uh, I think, Jörn. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Jörn can tell the story himself, but, but this was actually a bootstrapped company uh, sort of supply and access to, to uh, risk equity capital wasn't as great then as it is today. And for those of you who do not know Meltwater, it is, it is a sauce business 
and it's known for the, being the first online media monitoring company. Interesting also is that the headquarters is, is not in Norway, it's in San Francisco. So we're also keen to hear why, why that decision was taken. Today, it's, it's a global business, I think 1,600 employees, close to 30,000 customers. And um, in addition to the company itself, um, there's also something called the Meltwater Foundation, um, um, which launched something called the MEST program, which is a sort of entrepreneurial school of technology active in, in Ghana, in Africa, which we'll also talk about more. And uh, in 2012, Altor came in, and 2020, it was listed. Um, and it has a market cap of something like 900 million euro today. So a great success. And, and we, we at JP Bullen are also very happy to have worked with Meltwater, um, se selling two businesses, the, the two most recent ones, actually, Clear and Link Friends. All right, so that, that's Jörn, and I think we can go. And then we have Eric, who, who co-founded Viking Venture back in 2001. So we're very happy that Eric could, could join, because one of the earliest investors in, in what is extremely popular today, which is investing in, in B2B software businesses, which they've done from the start across the Nordics. And they've also now launched the first SPAC in Norway of 600 million, million NOx. So great achievement there. And then last, but definitely not least, uh, Tron Rieber Knudsen, who has a lot, long and illustrious career at McKinsey, I think close to, to 30 years. And then instead of sort of retiring and, and going golfing, he decided to become a private investor and has today something like 100, 100 or so investments. So probably easier than ever, one, one of the most prolific investors in Norway. And also, uh, also active on sort of supporting supporting talent development in Africa through through the incubator called called Antler. So those are the three speakers. Um, and then um, just sort of a quick <laughs> word from from the organizer here, JP Bullan. In case you don't know us, I'm not going to spend too much time on us. But um, for those of you who do not know us, we, we are basically a a global investment bank focused on technology, um, 150 people, of which 20 sit here in Stockholm, basically. So I think we can go. And then what, what we sort of do and, and offer um, events, events of this kind, webinars, research reports, uh, we're very active. And, and all of it is sort of available on our homepage for free. Uh, we release regular publication in, in the sectors we, we work with. I think, and yeah, we skipped ahead. Um, and, and mainly the, the services we offer are, are basically growth capital advisory and M&A advisory. Those are two, two main product areas. <clears throat> and here, here are just some, it, it's very high activity level in, in the software space, which is the, the main area we focus on. Uh, I think we've advised on something like 30, 30 transactions or so uh, globally this year within software specifically. We do also have other sectors, but, but software is, is, is the main one. Uh, okay. And then um, sort of, I think we, we, we have quite a lot of Norwegians and Nordic folks, but we also have some internationals. I, I'm not gonna spend too much time on um, uh, information about Norway, but what we can see here, it's of course interesting on the right-hand graph um, as the sort of, the value of uh, fossil assets uh, is, is, is declining uh, and the volatility we've seen, we, we can see clearly an, an uptick in uh, employment engagement in, in tech. We're gonna come to the more transaction and valuation metrics, et cetera, but, but we also see rapid rise in employment and, and students. So um, it's, it's a fantastic development. Norway as a country, uh, you know, we talked about it. Sweden is sometimes seen as a little bit the big brother here, but I think to be honest, there are quite a many of us who are more or less jealous of Norway because what's not shown on this page, it's a very rich country. It has very, very large amounts of capital available um, to deploy. Um, the world's largest sovereign wealth fund, I think, I think it's something like 1.2 trillion euros is the latest count, owning on average almost one and a half percent of, of the world's equity, which is more or less the combined GDP of the entire Nordics. So, so there's a lot of resources available. 
Um, and again, coming back to the troll platform, when this country sets its mind to something, it can really accomplish great things. So, some other uh, fun facts here from the Nordic rivalry point of view is it's the clear it's a clear leader in, in medals in the Winter Olympics. Also, uh, something I know they're very proud of. I think they have more more than twice the medals that we have in Sweden and significantly more than, than any other country. So um, great basis for, for the future development for sure. So now we've boosted the ego a little bit of, of everyone in Norway. So we can move on to, to the next slide. And, and this is more or less a summary of, of the report. And again, we're not gonna go into too much data in, in this uh, webinar, but what we can see, it, it's a very high activity across basically all forms of transactions, M&A, growth capital, uh, and I think one thing that Norway has become quite known for and which has stood out uh, during recent years is, is also the, the number of IPOs um, on Euronext, for example. Uh, I mean, the, the way we view tech, these are not all the IPOs. So this is in this, this, the sort of the sectors that we focus on at JP Bullhound. So it's primarily software um, and services type companies. And there we have 18 IPOs. Uh, since since COVID, it started with with Pexip, and I think the total total proceeds raised in, I, in those IPOs alone is, is something like two billion billion euro. So a lot of liquidity uh, for Norwegian companies going public. Of course, we had the auto store deal here, which which I'm sure a lot of people know about, which in itself was a two billion sort of transaction size. And I, I guess the kind of the only caveat that, that we would perhaps uh, uh, insert here is that we also see quite a lot of small companies going public in Norway compared to the other Nordic markets, which, which can create a bit of, bit of volatility um, from time to time. And I think what one, one key sort of takeaway from, from this report is that now that we also see a very high inflow of sort of growth capital, there is also another opportunity for, for companies to stay private longer and scale longer in a private setting before going public. I think that has not always been perhaps the case in Norway, but, but, but that is certainly the situation today as the data shows. And a number of um, unicorns have, have been produced. Um, that's always a popular, popular top topic. Uh, in, in some ways, it, it's not something completely new. There are a lot of large companies which have sort of emerged on the stock exchange, um, not only, only privately. I think one company that, that many of you may know of, and I, I remember when that was uh, up and coming, uh, which was taken, taken private by, by Cisco back in, uh, back in 2010 was, was Tanbay, uh, sort of speaking to the sort of video, video capabilities. That was actually acquired for, for over $3 billion back in 2010. So perhaps that was the first actual unicorn. But then we've seen a number of number of companies uh, hitting that mark uh, also in, in the private side, which I guess is sort of the new development here. Companies like Cognite, Gelato, Oda, uh, and so on. So I think uh, we can move on. Yeah, and I think th these are just the official statistics which confirm that that sort of private growth capital is now available in, in, a, in a completely different way than it used to be in Norway. Uh, if, we, if we look at this data from, from the Norwegian uh, Venture Capital Association, the total capital to tech companies is something in the order of, of 10 billion now um, during these last couple of years. So, so plenty, of, plenty of capital available also on the private side. Okay, and then <clears throat> um, also it's always interesting to sort of think about are there any specific clusters or areas of, of, of competence? And I think we've already touched on some of them and sort of tying back to the heritage of, of Norway, of course, industrial software uh, of various sorts. We, we see a lot of, we mentioned Cognite. It, it's a great example of that. The, the video technology, uh, we mentioned Tanbai, Pexip, and there are many other companies. We can talk about EdTech with, with Kahoot, of course, and many other businesses. And then them. Several other, several other successful verticals as well, uh, marketplace, uh, health tech, perhaps. Uh, so, so, so this is some of the things we would like to speak also with, with the panelists about where they see the, the relative strength of Norwegian tech. 
we, we can also say that I don't think we have that. We have that in the report. It's also interesting to look at just the, the types of international investors we see we see in Norway now. It, it's all the well-known investors, um, uh, very well-known investors like like SoftBank, having done several deals, but more or less all the well-known international growth and bio funds are are very active in, in Norway these days. And, and we also get a lot of questions from investors about Norway uh, these days, which is very encouraging. So um, I think I'll perhaps stop there uh, since time, time goes quick. So that, was a, that was a bit of an intro. And, and now um, the, I invite the panelists here to unmute and, and we can um, have, a bit of a, have, have a bit of a discussion. So I thought, um, I mean, perhaps, perhaps fitting, um, we should start with with with, uh, with the entrepreneur in the room, who's actually uh, achieved a great success story. And I don't know, Jörn, if you you would like to share some some of your reflection as as a Norwegian tech entrepreneur who's been, been active for for a long time, how how it was to sort of uh, found and develop a company in Norway. Yeah, no, I think I, I think it's um, very exciting to see the development in Norway. I think it's a lot of enthusiasm across the board, very early stage, there's growth capital, and not the least that people are even going public. The, the, the kind of pipeline to the public market has been as strong as it ever been, I think, and it's strongest in the Nordics and Norway in particular globally. So across all the different stages of a company development, there's actually a lot more capital now than it was before. Uh, the fact there are a number of unicorns out there as well, I think gives the Norwegians a lot of confidence that it can even happen here. It used to happen in Sweden, but now it can happen in Norway too. So I think everything is really uh, in place for a continued growth going forward. And I thought it was really interesting that you were mentioning all the engineering and all the technical uh, skills that were really harnessed and developed uh, to, to, to take out oil in the North Sea. There's a ton of technical expertise in Norway that hasn't really applied in traditional tech companies, or as you can find the tech sector. It more, it's been more industrial. But now things are coming from the industrial side and into to more standard IT companies, which is really, really cool. Uh, but I have to say that of this panel, I probably know the least about the Norwegian market because I, I, I moved to the US in 2005. So, and I'm dialing from San Francisco now as well. So if I look a little tired, it's because it's very <laughs> early here in California. <laughs> um, but I know that uh, my colleagues here on the panel have more, much more in-depth knowledge about what is happening on a day-to-day basis in Norway. But certainly from an outside perspective, I'm incredibly impressed with what's happening. And I think both Eric and Trum has individually also contribute a lot to see the development that we, we have in Norway now. Yeah. Um, and oh, I, out, of, out of curiosity, what, what was this sort of, I'm sort of, people are a bit curious how you end up locating the company in the US. Was that sort of re- access to capital or, or was it more customer driven or what was it? No, it was, is, it, it was a very early realization that uh, we had to grow, uh, grow globally if you wanted to, to be a big business. Uh, one of the jokes that I had was that there are bus stops outside of New York with a larger economy than what we have in Norway. So if you want to be a big business, uh, we probably should get out and, and, and enter the, the big markets. Uh, so. It was very intentional, but before we went to the US, we did make sure that we were able to get things to work in Norway. Uh, and then as all proud Norwegian companies that want to expand internationally, then we you know, went into the Swedish market. And after that, we got the confidence to go UK and Germany, and then we felt that we were ready. But I, I, I have to say that we were very intimidated going into the US market. Uh, the basis for our uh, software is really a search engine technology and it felt a little uh, audacious to go to the US and import a search engine technology coming from Norway but um, when you look back it actually worked out uh, pretty well yeah and uh, as an as a early 
if we, if we turn to, to you, Eric, um, as a very early sort of B2B, you're way ahead of the curve there. You started so early looking at B2B SaaS businesses or perhaps on-prem businesses at that time. Um, uh, what, what are your sort of general, general reflections on the, on the development? Well, I think it's been a huge development in the, in the Norwegian tech scene uh, and I'm talking about software. Um, you, as, at least the way we view it, uh, Norway is, is not a big B2C country. Uh, but it's it's uh, but we have lots of really good B two B businesses, and what we see in the in the types of businesses we invest in, they're typically bootstrapped, a little like what the Jern and the way they started out. So it's a team of engineers that see there is a problem, we could fix this by by creating uh, some software, and then they have their customers pay for the development first of the software, and at some point in time they have the possibility of adding two to three guys. That's usually two to three guys uh, <laughs> on the commercial side. Um, and that's when we come into play because then we really have to decide uh, should it be should we start continue growing and uh, just uh, take out dividends and have a happy life or should we really try to be a leader in our in our uh, niche whether it be a vertical or a geographic market or, or whatever it is so it takes time to develop those kinds of country companies to see that on average i think uh, the companies we invest in are typically 10 to 20 years old uh, having very solid customers and a very good product and a, a lot of things, ingredients needed in order to scale. What they don't have is uh, a real experience in going international and really going from 20, 30, 40 people to 100, 200, 300, 400, 500. Uh, so, uh, and that's of course where we come in in order to, to help guide them in, in that direction. And of course, also provide capital where, where that is needed. Uh, so I see, so what we see is, and we, I mean, we did our first uh, software investment. Uh, that was the first investment we ever did in a company called Powell uh, 20 years ago. Now we have done more than 30 B2B SaaS investments and a portfolio of 17 active companies. And I think what we see is that uh, the first wave of SaaS companies are now mat mature enough to be able to scale, scale much faster. Uh, so we see all these small niche players that are, uh, have grown up to become big enough, big enough to be scale-ups that we can eventually either sell to, uh, to national private equity and reinvest and be part of the journey going forward or to list as we've done with four companies uh, this, this year. So, um, so I think that's a very, uh, very interesting development. Lots of uh, talent um, in these companies. And of course, the challenge now is to be able to build scale, having more and adding more software engineers and more uh, people on the commercial side. And that's, of course, where going international makes it much more e easy to attract uh, talent. Mm. So that would be my take uh, um, uh, on the on the software side, at least. Mm. Lots of good good companies coming in. Lots of interest from international players, as you've probably seen. I think that. If someone had told me in uh, March last year that in the next nine months you will be uh, IPO in four companies, I would say that you have smoked something you should definitely not smoke. But that <laughs> has happened. Uh, and for once, there's a crisis where it actually, it's actually good for our companies and not bad. So what's happened is that uh, the world needed software two years ago. Now, now it really needs SaaS software. So it's expanded the market dramatically. It's also... Uh, speed it up the transition from on-prem software to uh, SaaS software. So I mean, even the Germans now understand that they need uh, SaaS solutions. <laughs> and at the same time, you don't need to do all sales physical. You can, it's physically, you can do it digitally, meaning that the cost of doing a sales has gone, has gone down. So I think uh, companies now positioned uh, to, to, to be able to grow in the niche as, as a very promising future because the market is just so much bigger than it was only, is only 12 to 18 months ago. Yeah, and um, and Tron then also. I mean, you, you've invested in so so many businesses, and, and we had a chat about that. Um, so, so you have quite a broad perspective on so so many so many so many sectors and companies. What, what was your kind of view and perspective on some of the trends and type of companies and niches? Yeah, uh, thank you. So. Um... Of course, I, I do see uh, uh, very significant opportunities in the in the Norwegian market, and just a few perhaps comments on uh, where I came from. Uh, so uh, you know, as you said, uh, I did spend most of my professional life as a global uh, partner in, in McKinsey, 
uh, serving uh, European tech companies uh, with global ambitions, but also uh, very strong companies here in, 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 the, in the Nordics. And then four or five years ago, I started to see something really interesting that the very best talent in McKinsey, they did not leave to go to the Equinors and the Ericsons of the world. They became founders. They started companies. Um, and that was a, a big, big change. And in a short period of time in Norway, we had something like 10 high quality new companies being founded by either people from McKinsey or clients of mine. Uh, and they asked me where I could be on support. And that's how I got into this. It was really following my passion for being an advisor to great town, trying to build something, something meaningful. Um, and uh, what we have seen coming out of that part is uh, that some of these people have built successful technology companies that have scaled very quickly. So, uh, uh, you know, a company like uh, Oda, uh, the e-grocer, uh, started only six years ago, uh, already at the unicorn stage with SoftBank as an investor. Uh, we have, uh, you know, McKinsey people came into Cognite with uh, Jum uh, Lervik, created that company only four or five years ago. Uh, Arundo Analytics uh, started here, uh, you know, Antler, the talent incubator, started all three McKinsey alumni from Norway, a global mindset. And I could go on and on. So that was my first avenue into this. High quality companies, uh, people with global mindset, using technology to scale quickly. So my experience has been that, you know, we can get to a very big scale in five years. And we have seen it happen time after time. Sometimes, you know, uh, I had this feeling, and I'm, I'm saying sometimes that what I saw was that Norwegian technology was a hidden gold mine. Eric and a few other people saw it, but most people didn't see it because we had this enormous layer of oil covering the gold mine. And remember every year in Norway, we used to spend 200 billion kroners on investments into oil and gas. And we hardly spent 2 billion into new company formation in tech. So 1%. So it's not strange that we had the crowding out of, uh, of tech as a sector, but underneath all of that was very high quality um, capabilities. So another angle into the market for us has been to actually map out the areas where we in Norway already have created global tech champions. And this reflects a bit uh, your list over the different clusters. But we have a list of nine or 10 of these. And we said that if you already have created a global leader uh, out of Norway, typically what you see is that entrepreneurs from those companies are you know, forming new companies. So they're doing incredibly well. And I think your, your mention of Tanberg is a good example because when Cisco acquired Tanberg, they moved their video conferencing engineers to Oslo. So Oslo Lysak became video valley in the world. And that became the, the, the foundation for Akano, Fexip, Headley that we're working with, whereby, and you can go on and on. Uh, Visma was the leading enterprise software player in Europe, worth 15 billion euros. You know, again, became the hub for enterprise software, B2B SaaS companies, many of which are supported by Eric and, and Viking. Other winter shipstead in marketplaces, global leader, uh, again, 15 billion euro market cap, you know, basis for creating new marketplace companies, including Otovo, which is a marketplace for solar energy installation. That a good friend of my client uh, from Shipstead uh, created and is now in seven countries uh, and listed. Uh, so, so that's what I saw. Uh, things can happen very quick. We see talent moving. We see capital increasingly being available, as you mentioned with Earnex growth, for example. Um, so it's a uh, it's a new it's a new uh, new set of opportunities, sir. And kind of my role here uh, has been a bit to uh, raise my hand uh, and say, you know, uh, let's let's all get together uh, and support the next generation of uh, tech founders out of Norway. Uh, it's fun. Uh, it's incredibly value creating. Uh, and it's even important for, for Norway because we needed to transition uh, and someone uh, needed to step up. And uh, with all the friends, I think uh, many of us have taken that role. 
um, and I think we're seeing that uh, it was the right thing to do. Um, and now uh, everyone wants to get into tech. So, so now uh, international interest is, uh, as you said, uh, incredibly high. I'm getting calls uh, pretty much every day from these different funds, family offices internationally, who wants to understand the deal flow and get in. Uh, they're all coming in earlier and earlier, in, you know, including Sequoia uh, invested into a company that had not been formed yet. They didn't even have the PowerPoint yet. Can you imagine Sequoia getting in at that stage? You know, uh, So what's happening? I mean, Sequoia is coming in and 50 other VCs wants to come in. Because as you know, there's a lot of kind of, you know, followership uh, in, in no. that industry. So uh, um, that's what I'm seeing. Uh, lots of opportunities, too few people. Um, so uh, of course, uh, making certain that we can attract, uh, integrate very diverse teams from all over the world uh, is what we are at at the moment. And we need to get better at that. Yeah, and I think Tron is uh, is having uh, is pointing on something very important, and it's, I think it's been an, there's an underlying exponential exponential function in the sense that if you want to develop these great companies, you need uh, also people who have done it before, who knows how to move uh, international, how to uh, how to scale, uh, and you need investors who've who's also done all the but all the uh, all the mistakes you need to do as an investor before you become a good investor. I think those are. Uh, and if you include then the software engineers that also has got the experience to know what, what it takes to build big systems, I think those are the kind of three really important bottlenecks that we're now starting to see that getting more capacity because we've had enough years for people to do one or two or three uh, ventures or be part of Jörn's uh, uh, company or other companies and having experience and take that experience into new companies and creating new ventures. So I think that's, so it's this really good snowball effect that we're now seeing that it's, it's picking up speed and that it's, it's been going on for many years and it takes time to, to gain speed because you need people to accumulate enough of experience through having lived many uh, enough calendar years to really be able to to build big things fast. Yeah, I think Eric is absolutely right there. I, 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 one thing that came to my mind, which is uh, important, is that um, in, in Norway, we're benefiting uh, from a government sector that is actually quite early on uh, being digital and providing digital uh, services and data. Uh, it might be surprising, but actually we are. Um, and that means that, for example, in property technology, PropTech, uh, where we are quite active, we have a number of companies that are benefiting from the fact that here, building data in the municipalities is available uh, immediately in digital form. Map data are available in digital form. And this was partly why we could create this company Spacemaker uh, in Norway that leveraged this to help architects optimize basically the development of, uh, of, um, of areas for apartment buildings. And this company in only three and a half years was developed uh, into a company that Autodesk uh, acquired for $253 million after three and a half years. It could not have been done most likely anywhere else um, because we had that access. And we also have a number of large companies here that are quite early in terms of using digital uh, platforms and are willing to experiment, including some of the state-owned companies, like in, in, that, in that sector, Statsbygg, for example, the building uh, company owned by the government. So that, 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 that I want to just point out that actually um, the, the readiness uh, of the government in certain of these sectors uh, are creating a platform for uh, creating digital winners out of Norway uh, and the government here should take a little bit more kind of pride in that and talk about it. Uh, it it's a big benefit. And I think that that's one of the big advantages of uh, yeah, Norway as a country, also in the Nordics as a region, is that we are so advanced when it comes to digital adeptness that uh, we are in the forefront. We see that when we, uh, if we look at the avenues and see you've done a great job in the US, you've gone, you went that earlier, Jörn. I uh, see that the kind of typical um, uh, typical path for our companies would be to be a market leader in, or a good position in always Sweden or Denmark. And then step one would be to uh, to build a strong uh, Nordic uh, presence in order to have a cash cow and in order to, under, to really uh, make sure that you're able to work outside your, uh, your home country. And then 
we see a lot of companies going into the Netherlands because that's the kind of second uh, most advanced when it comes to digital uh, digital uh, adeptness, and then and then UK tends to be in market number three, and then from the UK it's easy then to move into the US. Uh, what's interesting now is that uh, there's lots of things, good things going in, on in Germany. There's a big shift from on-prem to SaaS, so we see also a number of companies. Uh, moving up their uh, prioritization of, uh, of Germany. What Eric is saying is actually very interesting and it wasn't really something I realized until I, I saw it myself, but we are actually quite advanced in the Nordics. So what we discovered was that the kind of solutions that we had, uh, which was, you know, of course, new and innovative in the Nordics, when we came to the UK and Germany, our solution was way ahead of the existing players. And when we came into the US, I expected to see fierce competition because the US, of course, is a very sophisticated market. But even in the US, we discovered that our solution was way more sophisticated than the local players. And I remember that we were, you know, initially we flew over with four guys, we rented an office of 20 square meters and we're sitting there calling calling for, for two months, large companies, small companies, governments, organizations, so on. And after two months, we tried to understand, uh, you know, what kind of competition we've been up against. And sector after sector, uh, industry after industry, the kind of competition we were up against were, uh, were actually inferior from a technology perspective than ours. And I remember I was saying to the team, this market is wide open. This is, this is, now we just need to run as fast as we can. <laughs> and, and, and we did, and we did. We, we were, we were uh, obsessing about speed when we got to the US and we didn't, you know, there were a period we set up an office every, every three, three weeks. But, but it, you wouldn't believe it, but, but there are certain areas where the Nordics are actually uh, completely um, uh, top in, in the world. And that was definitely something we actually benefited from when we expanded and became global. And I guess uh, looking at how to go uh, international and global, that's also changing a lot now with uh, with after COVID-19 and everyone's gotten used to working uh, by screens rather than by, by physical meetings. So we have a common investment with uh, Tron, Atensi. Uh, they do gamified simulation training you know, using gamified simulation. It's a huge success growing extremely rapidly. Started out in Norway, then we uh, put up an office in in UK, attracted, and they attracted lots of big clients there. And um, and by following the customers, we have gone from 2 million to uh, to 10 million in knock in ARR in the US without having anyone present and driving that effort from uh, London. And then now, of course, setting up an office uh, in Boston as soon as possible, uh, once we can start uh, traveling. Same for a company called uh, Keystone. They're the leader within uh, uh, connecting uh, prospective students with universities. Their biggest market is in the US. They have um, uh, 500 of the top universities in the US. Um, the biggest flow of students being uh, Indian students wanting to, to study in the US. Uh, all of them are located uh, outside Oslo in Fornebu. And they work towards uh, they work globally, and they just work different shifts in order to match the, the time zone, so the different uh, different uh, uh, customers. So using love refugees that are people coming and following a Norwegian or a, or a Norwegian boyfriend or girlfriend, and speaking their natural languages, working towards their own geographies, and it it works uh, it really works well. So it opens up completely new ways also of expanding and being able to expand more rapidly. Uh, with less risk and less cost, uh, which is something that we, I think we've only seen the beginning of the types of roll-ups that we can see um, with the new modus operandi that we see uh, uh, getting into working life. And it's fascinating, uh, Eric, uh, how we start to see this play out. Um, we have a company called Superside uh, that basically do digital content production uh, in a global network. Um, in, in, as you can imagine, in a high frequency digital marketing world where you need to renew banners and your visual presence more or less every day. 
uh, large corporations need a partner to provide that. You don't go to an agency in New York, it's too costly and you don't build it internally. So as my friend Frederick, he saw this opportunity uh, and he's doing what Eric is saying. He's basically creating this network, not a lot of people on the ground, but they currently serve 13 different divisions of Amazon in the US uh, and uh, their uh, ARR uh, this year is probably going to be $35 million. Uh, and the term sheets they're getting, you can imagine, is unbelievable. Um, and it's building on this model. Uh, and, uh, and we see this, I mean, time after time. So, so uh, many of these uh, founders also have an international mindset, like uh, Fredrik, who started Superside, uh, worked with my team in McKinsey, then spent four years in Singapore, uh, working with Saloira and Rocket Internet. He saw this opportunity to have very skilled digital people, talent all over the world at the right cost position uh, and providing them into global accounts. Uh, and uh, is really working super side. It's an interesting company to have a look at. So I, I guess one, one question one might have given the sort of wealth of Norway and do you think that it has the gov is the government doing enough to to support this fantastic potential or, or how, how do you see that I, I guess it's a controversial topic but no I, uh, I, I think um, and uh, my friends should comment on it too I think a lot has happened in a positive direction in terms of the Norwegian government's uh, ability and willingness to actively support a new venture creation um, as you said, of course, the Norwegian government is unusually wealthy um, with a, a sovereign oil fund of $1.5 trillion and no debt, uh, no, no government debt. Um, so what they do currently, I think, is, is much better than what I saw four or five years ago. Innovation Norway, very early, basically, grants and support to new venture creation. The Norwegian government's own venture vehicle, direct vehicle, invest in oil. Uh, is, is very important as a, as a basically uh, support to private capital, um, additional. Uh, we have a climate fund for venture called the uh, Nysnø uh, in Stavanger. Uh, we have the research council being very active. And I think we're also very good at tapping into the European uh, investment council and the EU Green New Deal type uh, uh, support. Uh, as you know, we're not a member of EU, but we are part of everything. Uh, so uh, uh, we're pretty good at tapping into that too. I did the support and guidance of the Norwegian government, uh, Innovation Norway. So, and the Norwegian uh, state-owned companies also are quite, uh, I think, uh, good at taking early risk and providing support to many of our companies. So, uh, so um, uh, getting a lot better, uh, I would say. And uh, I hear people saying, like with Antler, we have this Norwegian incubator now. People are coming from all the world build in Antler in Norway. Uh, and they're saying that the support scheme they're seeing is one of the more attractive uh, in Europe at the moment. I think then the, uh, I completely agree it's, it's changed and it's, it's actually very easy to set up and do business in Norway uh, because of regulatory, uh, uh, the regulatory frameworks and also the fact that uh, it's a high trust in population and, and, and all that. I think the next stage, and that's something at least I spend time in discussion with politicians, is, is that if you look at the uh, uh, if you look at the uh, the pension funds, uh, the one targeted towards the international and the domestic pension funds, uh, if you look at shares, they only invest in listed shares. And there was a study uh, some years ago as to who owns Norway, and it was a book. Um, turned out that 80% of the value of Norwegian companies are not listed; only 20% are listed. So my usual question to politicians is that, do you, do, do you believe that there's uh, uh, good investments to be made in the 80% and not only in the 20%? And they say, yes, of course. And then I ask them, so why are, are we not doing that? So uh, at least I'm a big, ad, uh, big advocate for uh, starting also to, uh, to do as any normal investor, to have a, 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 a portfolio strategy that also has place for private equity both on the uh, international and the domestic fund, but then do that through uh, fund of fund structures. So such that you have uh, the, um, the private good uh, investors also receiving uh, re real capital from uh, the government being the biggest capital owner in Norway. 
uh, just just by being a rational uh, investor, not by having any support schemes or, uh, at all. Because what we do then is that we would be able to tap into the very best uh, private equity players in the world just from the fact that we would be an extremely attractive long-term investor. So I think that would be the next stage, and I think that could fuel growth even more, both uh, in uh, both in Norway and in national and nationally. Great. So, so it sounds like momentum is building, and, and a lot of the, the pieces are, are in place. Sort of, is there are there any sort of big hurdles? Otherwise, you see or, or positive outlook. What more could could, could be done or we're on the right way. It sounds like. Yeah, I think that if you look at the, uh, if you look at, uh, you mentioned IPOs, uh, IPOs, Daniel. I think uh, the beginning of 2000, there were uh, three listed uh, B uh, B2B SaaS companies on the no Oslo Stock Exchange. Now it's uh, now it's 19. If you look at the combined market cap, uh, it was nine billion knock. Now it's 83 billion knock. Uh, one and a half years later. Um, and what's been fascinating with the IPOs that we've done is that the, the majority, the clear majority of capital has been international capital. And the biggest, uh, the biggest market uh, uh, or it, from where the investors come is the US. So we have a lot of big US investors uh, investing in our companies. And I think that says something about the quality of the companies and the prospects of growth. And, but it also says something about multiples. So if you look uh, on average, uh, there's a kind of threefold uh, bigger, uh, higher multiples in the US versus uh, the Nordics and, and Norway, uh, meaning that if you're able to, to get into companies uh, with, with good growth, they will eventually go into having more US type multiple. So you have a multiple expansion and at the same time, clear, clear growth. And I think that's some of the things that are attracting a lot of capital now into, into the Nordics, Nordics and into Norway. And I think that's a very good sign. So uh, it was mentioned before, but we clearly see the best investors, both on listed, uh, listed SaaS companies and private SaaS companies and are very active in Norway, very active with our, us and our companies. And that's a great sign because that is going to fuel growth even more. Uh, and it also takes away some of the challenge of having competent capital to, to help these companies grow. So that's something we can get help from from, uh, from the international side. And then the bottlenecks will really be uh, being able to get hold of uh, management, able to do scale ups internationally. And then we need, of course, more much more international uh, talent uh, joining us. Uh, so I think there's a uh, very good things in play. Um, the thing now is to make sure that all the investors get the good journey and see good returns and, and they will take their money back. Uh, what, what we've seen is uh, since we started the, uh, the, the kind of clear focus on B2B SaaS uh, seven, eight years ago, then we typically invest some tens of millions per year. Now we're between 500 and a billion million knock per year. And, it's, and that's, of course, because people see good returns and then want to invest more. And I think that if we could kind of have a broader market having that same experience, we'll see some heavy influx of capital uh, to get with talent uh, coming into the tech sector and, of course, fueling growth even more. In, uh, in terms of, um, I think, our discussions on, on this topic with uh, our portfolio companies, uh, I think the the route to basically a listing in Norway uh, early next and with, with strong basically support and capital there uh, is very clear and proven, as Eric is saying. And for a certain type of companies, uh, it's clearly the right route. There are also companies uh, that probably, probably are better served by staying longer uh, in the private uh, arena. Um, and uh, some companies have more technology risk, is a little bit less mature, might basically have uh, bigger investments with negative cash flow or a longer period of time. They're more suited for international venture capital, growth capital to stay private longer. And uh, to develop those companies, we need to have stronger bridges to the international venture capital uh, environment, uh, private capital environment and also build stronger, uh, even stronger platforms in Norway. Uh, and, uh, and it's happening. Uh, I think it's, it's a good development, both in terms of links to the international and building in Norway. Uh, and that's also a very important contribution. 
Uh, we, for example, uh, as Norwegians, were very happy a few weeks back uh, when Lasse Arnesen and the team uh, listed on New York Stock Exchange a Ford truck, a $2.6 billion listing. Uh, company started in Norway. Uh, with Lasse, of course, and the team took that uh, to the US and was supported by uh, both, both US venture capital and growth capital, and probably listed at the right point in time for Ford truck. So I think we, we are keeping that in mind that uh, for some companies you go more the international venture route, other companies quicker earn next uh, li listing. Uh, and, uh, and, and the fact that you have those options now uh, is terrific. Well, as, you, as uh, Trond points out, I mean, if you're looking at the Norwegian venture, venture and growth, uh, growth equity scene, it's still very scattered. So, uh, yeah. And, and I think that's a, that's, that's the result, unfortunately, of uh, 10, 15 years with very few uh, teams being able to, to build size. Um, and, um, uh, and there's been a lack of uh, capital uh, for the funds. I think with more capital available, we could have had more teams that could have now had the maturity needed in order to, to take on bigger, uh, bigger uh, challenges and, and bigger companies and grow them faster. Mm -hmm. So it takes time. Now, I, I think, still think that that is the major bottleneck in Norway is that there's still a lack of highly competent um, uh, VCs, growth investors uh, that know who knows what they're doing and have enough mm -hmm. capital to, to fund the companies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's Sorry. interesting to see uh, the migration of talent. Uh, something uh, I just want to mention that because we, we are shifting focus in Norway, we are starting to see uh, talent uh, that used to, to be in the oil and gas industry moving into venture creation, starting companies. And particularly, we see this around Stavanger, for example. Um, and I think uh, it was a good thing that we started with the troll. Because one of the things uh, with the oil and gas industry was that it was very rich. So you could actually invest into very deep capabilities. Uh, so, you know, absolutely triple A you know, quality. Um, and when they're taking this uh, capability into new areas, uh, magic can happen. But just mm -hmm. a very interesting example is that uh, in Europe now, the leading innovation within electric vehicle chargers is happening in Stavanger. And the two companies, one called Subtech that is listed at 4.5 billion NOC, and another company called Easy that we are supporting, which is growing much faster than Subtech uh, and is super profitable. Uh, and it's probably worth a lot, but they, they, they don't need money because they're making so much money. Mm -hmm. uh, but these people are coming from the oil and gas industry uh, and innovating that whole electric vehicle charging. Um, we have another team coming from Flumberg Share on signal processing that are taking signal processing capability from Seismic into creating a totally new generation of hearing aid based on edge computing, cloud, app, total reinvention, which is super exciting. Then so many of those type of examples um, that is fueling uh, this, uh, this, this growth uh, also. Yeah, and you also see uh, software companies uh, having had uh, oil and gas as a, ma as a ma major customer, and ex for example, Excite in our portfolio. Uh, when, whenever there was, um, uh, whenever you were applying for new license, this, the, 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 their software is what everyone used in order to be able to build these big documents, which is a, basically uh, a big project where you need to product manage it and it needs to be of high, high quality. And using that in order to go into other industries and doing the same thing. So now they're now bigger in the US than they are in Norway, but that was a starting point. So I think we'll also see companies where they're starting customers worlds within the energy field, mm. and they use that as a springboard in, into moving into other vert verticals. And of course, since the uh, the oil industry is also so U.S. centric, they're already used to working in the U.S. market, which is a, which is a good thing. Mm. Maybe, maybe the biggest trend, at least outside in, that I feel that you see in Norway is that I think Norway always had very good engineers. You know, object-oriented programming was invented in Norway at, at the Norwegian Computing Center. The fundamentals for the mobile telef telephony was developed at Kjeller in Oslo. But nobody knows that this came from, from Norway. Uh, it was the Sweden, Finns, they ran off with the mobile technology to commercialize it. So I think there's always been very, very good engineers across the Nordics. In Norway, there's always been very good engineers as well. 
But in Norway, there has been much less a focus, interest, or capability to commercialize that fundamental technology. And I think the reason why we see that a lot of companies are starting to, to succeed in Norway is that the, there's a deeper appreci appreciation for the importance of commercializing your, your, your technical product and skills. There's a deeper appreciation for marketing and sales and bringing the technology out to the international market. But I, I do think that that is still probably the biggest area for Norwegian uh, startups to still work on. Because in order for Norwegian companies to become really big, uh, they need to go, get out of Norway. And I think Sweden is just a phenomenal, phenomenal country in that regard. I think Sweden is a complete outlier globally in terms of how they, from a small population, from a small, small country, in the peripheral of the world, if I may say, uh, have consistently been building global uh, leaders within their space. And I'm talking about a long time before technology, but it started <laughs> in, in, in industry companies, Ericsson, uh, Volvo, uh, you know, Svenska, SQF, and, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, Bay. you know, there, there, there's a, there's, there's no shortage of those. And then you have IKEA, you, you, you have a whole range of global brands that come out of um, Sweden as well. And of course, this trickle into software. So what Sweden always had has been a global perspective. Um, back in the days, I listed a company on the Swedish stock exchange. And what I was baffled to, to see that there were so many Swedes that never been to Norway. And I don't think there's any Norwegian that haven't been to Sweden. But part of that was that Sweden had this global perspective. Sweden has, has a much more global perspective in their culture than, than what Norway has. And I remember there was this big sign on, on, on Arlanda when I landed at Stockholm. And it was, welcome to Sweden, home of international success. <laughs> that was back in 2000. I thought that was phenomenal. You wouldn't see that in Norway. Very but humble. But the Swedish mindset of, of the global global expansion to become the best in the world uh, is something that has consistently been generating global successes. And, and we, if you have global successes, you can use the leadership talent, the marketing expertise, the, the, the skill set you acquire, that, you, you, that is necessary, you, they are transferable. They're transferable from company to company and in times also from industry to industry. Mm -hmm. I do think that that is still the biggest thing to, to further develop in Norway. I think we have successes showing that we have in global engineering talent, but that is actually something we always have. But going forward, making Norwegian companies coming to the US, making big in the US, breaking mm -hmm. into the global markets, that's really where the big, big battleground is. And, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, I know I spoke with Lasse yesterday, uh, Lars Andresen, he's eager to, to help uh, European companies. And he and I was brainstorming a little bit about it. Um, in San Francisco, I actually started a, a, a members club for tech entrepreneurs. And where we're going to, what we're going to do that, we're going to create an environment that, that welcome entrepreneurs from all over the world, including Norway, including Sweden, but global entrepreneurs that come to Silicon Valley that, that want to break into the US market and try to team them up with, you know, entrepreneurs, proven executives and so on uh, to help them. Because I remember when I came to the US in 2005, I landed in, in Silicon Valley and I was driving up and down 101, but I'd never been there before. And I, I thought Silicon Valley was high rise, high rise building and high tech, but I didn't find nothing of that. I was completely clueless. Uh, and and uh, I, I know that I would have appreciated a little bit of help um, back then. And that, but that is definitely something that is possible today. So that sounds very, very promising. Um, I guess we, we need to round off, would love to continue. Um, thank you again uh, to our panelists for joining. Um, I'm sure all the participants have really appreciated this discussion and the input. And uh, again, the, if you want to download the, the report, um, you can do that from the homepage. And uh, yeah, I, I guess we, we, we round off now. And thank you all again. For all. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you for joining everyone.